Hello, and thanks for being with us on The New Life Show with Dr. Michael Lightman. Hello, Dr. Lightman. Hello, everyone. Hello, Nitzam Azoz. Hello. And today we'd like to talk about the self-esteem of a nation, how a nation sees itself. How do the people of that nation see themselves not as individuals, but as a part of that nation? It's going to be really interesting. Be with us, Nitsa, please. Yeah, self-esteem is a very broad definition that includes many things. Qualities and self-definition and identity and my abilities and skills. Many things that put together give a person a sense of who he is. How talented, how smart, how capable I am and so on. It creates a certain way in which a person sees himself. Now, usually there is positive or negative or high or low self-esteem. Now, the same goes for a nation. A nation also has a certain way in which it sees itself. Of course, it doesn't have to be homogeneous. Maybe part of the people see the nation through positive eyes. Some don't. But there is a general perception of how people that are a part of the nation see themselves. And this has many implications. But before we delve into that and how it shapes who we are, let's try and understand the factors that shape our self-esteem in relation to our nation, to that group that we're a part of. So what are these factors that shape the way we see who we are in relation to our nation? I don't feel that I have this inner image, feeling of the Jewish people. So you're saying when you look at the Jewish people, you don't have a picture of how we see ourselves. No. First of all, there's the Jewish people that are in the land of Israel, and they too are divided into many, many parts. This week I met with students of mine, a part of the Jewish people that originally came from Ethiopia. In two weeks, I'm going to travel to India for a wedding of one of my students who's getting married to a young lady from the Ukraine. My son, who's living in Canada, his wife, she's Jewish, but originally she's from France, and so on and so forth. And also I have so many students in North America, South America, that are Jewish, that are not Jewish. I can't say that there is something that connects these groups whether it's individual Jews or small groups that connects them into a nation. One way or another, a nation has to dwell in a certain place. There has to be some kind of a general culture. And it's not enough for a nation to just have a common history, even though that our history isn't common either. So it's not enough. Today, we can't point at something that we can say that this is something that unites the people, that's general for the entire nation, for all of its parts. There isn't. Is it different than the way other nations see themselves, the English, the French? Of course, they have a piece of land that they're all related to, even if they live in other places. But they all know, this is France. This is where our origins are from, and so on. An American Jew who was born in America or in South America or in some other place can't say that. He does not identify with the land, with the state of Israel. So self-esteem is related to geography? Look, none of them know their history. 
This is a well-known fact. The current situation where we're in a certain kind of relationship, that we're related in a certain way, that we identify with one another, that doesn't exist either. Culture, education, nothing. We live among other nations, and any Jewish part that lives in a certain country are integrated there, they belong, they're a part of that country. You can't say that we're a nation. You can't say that this nation has a country. That's not how they see it. Also, the Jewish people doesn't know its past and also doesn't know about its future. And therefore, how do the Jewish people see themselves? I don't think that the Jewish people currently exist. I also don't think that the state of Israel exists in the way that a country should exist. And therefore, our future seems so problematic. So loose, because we can't organize for ourselves a common foundation of the past, present, and future. So, in order to have a certain sense of self-definition, we have to be connected to the past, the present, and the future. Yes, and that here, in the land of Israel, we have to be connected to a certain geographical place, Yes, and for this place to be as a melting pot in which we will reach a state where you have the Jewish people living in the state of Israel, understanding what do they have to do, what is their destiny, what is their goal, what are they supposed to come to, what is their plan in regard to themselves, in regard to mankind, so that they will know how to answer all of these things proudly. This is something that does not exist. There's no such thing. We're in a state where we're being erased off maps. Literally. I open some atlas in English or in Russian or in some other language. And there, instead of Israel, it says Palestine. So what are we talking about here? So, what you're saying is how someone else defines me, meaning someone else puts Palestine on your map. But I, the way I see myself as a nation, as a people, I don't know whether you're building a nation, whether you're identifying with others, where your goal is first and foremost to have a nation, that you build a nation. I don't see that this is how it is. To the contrary, I see that those forces that want to rip us apart are greater than the forces that maybe somehow try to connect us. I see it from day to day more and more evidently, clearly, that this is how it is. Okay, so you're saying that it's very hard for us to have some kind of a common feeling, vision in regard to who are we as a group. How does that influence us as a nation, as a group, the fact that we don't have a clearly defined picture of who we are? The exile that we were in and that we continue to be in is still distancing all of us from one another. It doesn't allow us to connect, to come together, to unite, to really be as one nation. Each of us keeps himself to himself, meaning everyone's upholding their own culture and suppose if some secular part in the nation can somehow be in a mutual kind of connection and understanding, but we have a large part of the population, dozens of percents, that are religious. And I'm not talking only about the religious Zionists, but I'm talking about the Orthodox Jews that 
don't want to accept this country or the nation or having anything to do with this. And you can also understand them. But how to bring all of this to some kind of a common realm, to some kind of a common mutual identity? We don't have that. So you're saying, who are we as a nation? Depends who you ask. Right? And therefore, we're not a nation. Because, nonetheless, a nation is a kind of connection between people. Afterwards, within that connection, there are different parts, but there is a connection. Here you have no connection. Here, to begin with, there is such a division that cuts between the parts of the nation to such an extent that no one wants to hear or see the other wanting for the other to simply disappear altogether. Talk to the extremists from the left or religious Orthodox Jews, see what goes on. The hate is so deep that I, as a leftist, for example, I look at the Orthodox Jew, ultra-Orthodox Jew, for example, I'm interested in having Arabs instead of him. So is it a sign, does it mean that I accept ourselves as a nation? That I feel us as a nation? Of course not and so on and so forth. And so, from here, what stems is that assimilation is, in the United States, up to 80%, and also in Europe, meaning assimilation is a result of a person's inability. It's the lack of identity, meaning I don't identify, I don't want to be a part of this, I don't want to be identified with this. I prefer to identify with another nation where I grow up, where I live, that I feel that I belong there. Like in America, for example, then I'm an American. I don't stand out as a Jew. Is it important for the people of Israel to have a common identity? It's not a matter of whether it's important or not. What's important is whether, according to the laws of nature that are controlling us, and whether we like it or not, we see that we're controlled by a certain set of laws. And are we supposed to live by these laws? And maybe we have even a certain role that we have to carry out among the nations of the world. And according to the way the nations of the world relate to us, we see that we can disappear. We have to be among the so-called 70 nations of the world. Why? Because so it says, so it was decided. This is how it is in nature, and we can't do anything about it, meaning we cannot disappear, we can't vanish. Even in regard to the ten tribes that left us, that disappeared, we feel that soon they might reappear, meaning we come from a people that cannot destroy itself. Meaning, even if I identify with another group among which I live, and I don't identify with the Jewish people, but still I won't be able to disappear. No, I won't be able to assimilate. You won't. So there is some kind of inner identity here, but this is something that's not up to me. It's not that I determine this identity. Okay, but what then? This is how it is from nature. Meaning, no matter how I camouflage myself, and I'll want to get married to someone and do something, still, I'll stay who I am. Meaning, that I can't be diluted by anything. Suppose, if I compare my identity with the identity of a Frenchman or an Englishman, here there's no problem. After several generations, they can say, my grandparents were French, and I'm already a Filipino, and even forget about that and no one will see it. However, a Jew, if he gets married to that same Filipino, for example, or the other way around, 
after ten generations, where just one generation out of these ten generations was Jewish, it'll be discovered and known and felt in the grandchild of the grandchild of the grandchild of that person that your great-great-grandparents were Jewish, that there is some Jewish seed there that can't disappear, assimilate, or be diluted in any way. Usually identity is really related to common history, geography, cultural narrative, and this applies to any nation. Now, in regard to the Jewish people, their identity doesn't really depend on any external factors, but more on internal factors, that even if I try to get rid of them, hide them, it doesn't really help. There's this inner seed that exists in every Jew, that it's there all the time beneath the surface, and this is actually what creates the identity. It's not that I build a certain narrative, story that I organize, and I can identify with the story or not identify with it. You're telling me it won't help. You can tell yourself whatever story you want. The identity of a Jewish person is something much deeper. So what is it? It's a gene that exists above our world. A gene? Component. That exists in a Jewish person. Back from those days in which Abraham arranged, established the nation. And this gene, it didn't exist before those Babylonians that wanted to join Abraham gathered around him. But when they did, when they joined him, and he connected them, according to the method of love covers all crimes, the method of love another as yourself, they broke certain boundaries between them. And then all those people that connected around him formed into a single reality of connection. And this single reality of connection that they have formed internally, mentally, this is what it means, what is called to be a Jew, the unity that they have attained. And since then, it exists in each of these descendants. And because this is related to connection, to unity, to something that's above our egoistic world, you can't erase it, you can't do anything about it. It simply exists. And even though that we don't yet understand how, but it passes from parents to children. Because all in all, we're like any other animal. So how do we pass this interconnection, which is above the human degree that they have attained, how do we pass it through our seed, through what? Meaning it's not a biological gene, but a spiritual one, so how does it pass? Right, but this is how it passes. But it's enough for us to know this and not to get into all these things. There are explanations, but these explanations, they're pretty complicated and are unrelated to the precise subject of the wisdom of Kabbalah. And therefore what follows is that we do come from some special species and this is something that you can identify. It's possible to identify this if a person really comes from a mother and a father, meaning that he has this lineage from those that came out of Babylon. Let's put it this way. But, in order to awaken that, a person has to identify with his root. 
that came from Babylon, with the process that he went through throughout all of these incarnations until this day, and that he does want to and is capable of continuing this lineage, these incarnations, until he completes it in that state that he's meant to reach, where he brings himself and all of mankind to connection. And this is the key, to be able to acknowledge this and to identify with it. Yes, with a connection. A person inside this broken, shattered nation and the entire world that's also really broken and that in this entire terrible, broken state, he has a role. Now, you know, in psychology, when a person reaches a certain process where he feels a low self-esteem, then we define self-esteem as a kind of gap between how a person grasps himself and how he really is and how society sees him, and there are many gaps there. Now, if we look at the Jewish people through these eyes and their inability to really identify, understand, acknowledge the root that they come from, what kind of implications does it have? How does it project outwards the gaps between how we perceive ourselves and how things really are? The fact that we're broken and that we're distant from one another and we have different disputes, our differences in opinion, once we start bringing ourselves together, gathering ourselves, and we see that it's impossible, then we need the wisdom of Kabbalah that explains not how to directly connect going against the separating forces. This way it's impossible, but there's a special method. I'm not going by way of one against the other, but I go above, one above the other. The forces of separation and the forces of connection. I make a sandwich out of them. That's called love covers for all crimes. Where I understand that we all hate each other, we reject each other, we don't want to be together, we criticize each other endlessly, but we don't deal with that. What we should deal with is how do we connect above it and we keep all of our differences regardless of how many there are. But my work is to connect above the differences. And I love these differences. I love them. I keep them. And actually, upon them, I build a second level. You mentioned criticism, and it's very true. Something that really characterizes our nation is that we have tremendous criticism toward each other. Does it influence our self-identity? This is exactly what we have to do, meaning there cannot be a nation, specifically the Israeli nation, I'm not talking about the other nations of the world, unless we build ourselves on these two levels. The lower level practically exists. The hate, the separation, the rejection, everything exists. Only we don't know how to correctly relate to it. We have to relate to it as something necessary upon which we have to build another layer of connection. And then we, in our correct attitude, relation to these two levels, we build ourselves. And then we will be the Jewish people. This this layer, what is it made of, this connecting layer? Love, concessions, all the opposite things to what exists on the lower level. We have an example from the lower level. We should build the opposite on the higher level. To concede what? You give an example of extreme denominations in our nation. How can they create a connecting layer between them? No, not this way, not one against the other directly, like to bulls. 
but one upon the other. We're at the lower level, we're in collision. On the higher level, we have to build a connection between us, which means what? That even though that we have our differences in opinion, hate, a history full of grudges or whatever, it doesn't matter. We don't erase that, we don't forget about it, but precisely above all that we build love, connection, mutual consideration with everything that we have. And we don't let go, we don't forget any tiny thing that separates us, that makes us hate each other, reject each other. Now, if we put all of these things that you said about identity together, we can say that criticism is a result of our inability to connect around this one identity. And this is why there is such separation, because we're in conflict and the fact is that we're not working on our connection. But historically-wise, we were already supposed to reach connection. And so the preparation for connection that exists on a higher level that we're supposed to realize starts separating between us. And then we become even more separated and broken, even beyond what's needed in order to reach connection. Because our time's almost over, I'd like to ask, what follows is that there's a gene, you called it a spiritual gene, or doesn't matter how we call it, that exists in Jews, that if I practically understand what this gene is, it's the ability to connect with those that are the opposite of who and what I am, above all of our differences, in love. Yes. And this is related only to Jews, or does it eventually have to spread to the entire world? If this is how the Jewish people will connect above all of their differences, then, all in all, this method of how to connect above all the differences will start spreading to the entire world. It'll start acting in the entire world because all in all, in relation to the world, we are that part of Babylon that united and they are the remaining part of Babylon. So connection between opposites will be the new formula of life for all the people in the world. Yes, but they don't really have to work at it. It's enough for us to care for this all the time, and they as if come together around us and learn how to do it. How do we do it and support us? And whatever exists in us will spread to them. And if we will not succeed, then no one will. So we're like the research and development of this technology of connection between opposites. Not only, this is what I want to say, that they all the time have to be next to us and to push us towards greater and greater connection. And what we attain, achieve in our ever-growing connection spreads on to them. Their work is to be around us and to push us. But the implementation, the realization of connection is upon us until the end of correction. And then whatever we attain every time, layer after layer, spreads onto them too. Dr. Lightman, thank you very much. We'll continue this on our next show. Thank you, Nitsa. Thank you for being with us. Till next time, all the best.